Uh, so today I'm going to give you a very gentle introduction about uh, our recent release open source product, which is called Gina. Uh, as you can see here, Gina is the cloud native neuroserve solution. And uh, uh, so for most of people who don't know about neuroserve, so this could be a very good introduction uh, to tell you that uh, what Gina can do and what, uh, what the neuroserve, what the future, future of the neuroserve could be, right? And uh, so a good start would be like, uh, let's talk about neuroserve, right? So what, what, is, what is so different about neuroserve and how, how can we uh, use neuroserve to do some, some things that we cannot do using uh, traditional, traditional search? Uh, yeah, I will also go through some hello world example and also tell you what is the best way to learn Gina as, as kind of like a framework. Right. Uh, as in, uh, at last, I will talk about our, our company's mission, right? It's uh, more beyond building an open source framework. It's about building an ecosystem around your research. Okay, and eventually uh, we will have some time to for Q and A. So if you have any question during the session, right? So please write it down in the chat box, and uh, I will go over it after the uh, after this slides. Okay, <clears throat> so what is neural search? Right? Uh, so I believe the the idea of the motivation of neural search is actually not very new, right? So it start from the motivation. Uh, of finding similar text in the uh, large database, right? finding semantic similar text. So for example, here I listed three de definitions of microservice. Right? So they, I just grabbed from Wiki, from, uh, from other computer magazine, or from, uh, from other tutorials. Right? So this is from three different sources. And so the idea is actually you, you want to, let's say, given one paragraph of the definition of microservice, you want to find all the, all the similar definitions of microservices. Right. Uh, While well, traditional search may not be very well uh, in this case, uh, may not serve very well in this case, because they are based on keyword. And uh, usually uh, in this uh, scenario, you have to really understand the semantic behind that right, in order to retrieve all possible uh, definitions uh, from the database. Right. So this is a very, let's say, a very toy example. Uh, but of a real-world scenario. So you can imagine this kind of techniques uh, can be used in chatbot, can be used in QA system, can be used in customer service, right? And uh, so this is kind of like a semantic search. Okay, so what are the challenges here? Let's say we want to solve this kind of uh, uh, text, semantic text retrieval problem, right? So what, what, what are the challenges we must solve in order to build such system? And uh, so here I list four challenges, four major challenges uh, when we build a neural search system for text search. So the first problem is how to quantize the semantics. How do you, re how do you represent uh, the semantics of a document, of a short tweet, of a paragraph? Right? How do you represent that? Well, if I ask this question like 20 years ago, right, people have no idea how to represent this uh, semantics properly. Right? Uh, but nowadays, if I ask the same question again to you guys, and uh, you know that, you, you may answer, okay, then let's just use BERT, right? Let's just use one of those BERT algorithm uh, models, right? So, it is, so nowadays, it's pretty clear you can use BERT or deep learning to represent uh, a paragraph or document into a, a fixed lens a vector, right? So these mathematic vectors can be uh, basically summarize all the semantic representation of many meanings of the original documents. And uh, okay, so the problem, the first problem is solved, right? So the second problem is once we have this bunch of vectors, right? How do we uh, store them efficiently? And how do we retrieve them efficiently? Uh, so some of you probably noticed that Facebook like uh, probably five or six years ago, uh, released uh, open source software called uh, FAST, right? Facebook uh, Semantic Search and uh, Index, right? And also uh, Microsoft also released some kind of like this kind of vector database. Uh, there are also some uh, existing uh, open source vector database such as uh, Annoy uh, from Spotify and also the uh, uh, Melvis, Melvis from Zelis, right? And uh, so they can be used to store the vectors in very efficient way. Okay, uh, so it seems that we have a we have a we have a we have a database to to store this kind of thing, right? So the second problem is also checked, 
And uh, now the requirement come to the uh, how do we define the similarity, right? So once we have the vectors, when, once we, we we can retrieve this vector from the database, uh, now the requirement becomes uh, okay. So why is this vector more similar to that vector uh, compared to the compared to the other vector? And uh, uh, you can of course use very sim uh, very naive or straightforward metrics such as L2 distance, Euclidean distance, Hamming distance, and so on. Uh, but you also you can use some very uh, sophisticated models such as you use deep learning to learn the metrics uh, between the uh, between two vectors, right? Or between two representations, just just like we do in BIDAF in the machine reading comprehension, right? Uh, we we learn the metrics rather than using simple. Uh, cosine uh, similarity. Uh, okay, so the last question is often ignored by a lot of practitioners. Right, is that uh, does your work, does your model work on both super long or short document? Right, the general it's a generality. Right, uh, so the solution of this generality is often you you need to do some preprocessing. So, for example, in this case, you have to segment your document into sentences. <coughs> Right? And for each sentence, you need to do the encoding, right? So this often requires some domain-specific knowledge uh, for the preprocessing step. But it's super important, and often people, uh, when they think about neural search, they just throw in a document and convert this document to one single vector, and that's actually not, uh, not, 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 not good enough if you, if you do that in practice, right? Because uh, semantic has kind of like a, uh, Mm, uh, kind of like a, a, there, there is a unit, there is a basic semantic unit uh, where you have to optimize it, and this optimization actually is implemented in the preprocessing step. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so now we we talk about the text, right? As the text, uh, semantic text uh, search, right? So what if we want to extend uh, this kind of application into image and video, right? So what is changed and what is not, right? Uh, so basically, at least uh, still the, here, the four challenges here, right? So you can see that we basically solve the same problem, right? But rather than using BERT model to do the representation, right? We use, for example, some VGG, some CN, ResNet, this kind of CN-based computation model to do the representation, right? So that part is not changed at all, right? So you just replace the model by some computation model. Okay, so the last the, 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 the last question uh, that previously we talked about whether your model work on both long document and short tweet, right? But now we, we face more or like less the same problem, right? But instead of instead of working on the text, we're now talking about whether your model work on large or small images or long or short videos, right? So here you see the importance of preprocessing, right? So you need to segment the image or video uh, into patches, right? And uh, uh, the uh, the size of each patch actually depends on, let's say, empir empirical experiments, right? Uh, depends on your experience. So you need some domain knowledge to select the best adequate size uh, for the for preprocessing, right? Okay, so uh, combining all the three modalities, right? So we'll see that uh, actually to solve neural search problem, uh, the, there, are, there, are, there are a couple of issues or a couple of steps that one must go through, right? The encoding step uh, to represent some document into real world document to the ve ve vector, right? And the indexing step to store and retrieve the vector uh, efficiently. Uh, the scoring step uh, to compare two vectors uh, in some kind of matrix. And, and also the preprocessing step, right? To select the correct size uh, for uh, vector representation. Uh, okay, so if we put the uh, neural search that we just talked about uh, along with this traditional symbolic search, uh, which could be based on elastic uh, search, could be based on uh, Lucene, could be based on Apache Solar, right? So what, what is the difference between uh, the old one and the newer one, right? Uh, so we see there, there is actually not so much difference, right? So you, you all have this indexing step, uh, which is often doing on, uh, offline, right? And you also, you also have this parsing step, which is on, in, in the online. So you use, when user input some query, you need to do some parsing for this query and then uh, represent that in the same space uh, with the document that you've just indexed, right? So the difference is that 
uh, in Elastic, we use Analyzer. Right? We use Analyzer to represent a query, to represent a document into some symbolic representation, and then the matching happens in that symbolic representation. Well, in the neural search system, we use deep neural network right, to do the parsing and to do the indexing. Right? So we represent query and document into the, let's say, the uh, latent space, right? the latent vector space. And then we do the matching there. <coughs> Uh, so that, that's basically the difference, right? So we see, so if you want to know more about the, the traditional symbolic uh, IR system, uh, symbolic neural information retrieval, and also the neural information retrieval, please, uh, please uh, read this blog post, which I published like uh, two years ago, uh, uh, talk about how to do this, uh, the symbolic one and neural search one uh, in an end-to-end -end way for product search. Okay, so the next uh, difference between the, the next difference I want to highlight for neural search system is that uh, for traditional machine learning system, you, are, you usually have two different runtime. So I call it runtime, but you can call it, let's say, running mode, right? Uh, for traditional machine learning system, there is a train and there is test or inference, right? And uh, for typical search system, uh, there is an index runtime and search runtime. And, but for neural search system, uh, because your model, your, your system is based on deep learning model, right? So there is a third runtime, and, uh, uh, which is basically train, index, and search. Right? So there, this is another uh, major difference between the neural search system and the traditional search system and the traditional machine learning system. Okay, so <coughs> neural search seems uh, seems to be a very promising, uh, let's say, solution, right, to, to solve all this kind of cross-modality, multi-modality problem. Uh, but what stops people uh, from using that? Right? So what, what is the problem? Why, why don't we see a lot of people using neural search in the production, right? Uh, so the problem is that uh, the first scalability, right? So you, uh, neural search is based on deep learning, but deep learning is very heavy, right? If you do that in, in production, your search system, the QPS of your search system is pretty low, right? So query per second is pretty low. And uh, this is, uh, often doesn't meet the requirement of the production, right? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Well, the second problem is the flexibility, right? So, <coughs> so every time, I believe every morning you check out the Twitter, you check out the archive, you find some new models right, pop up. And uh, you want to integrate this new model into your system, right? So, for example, if you look at BERT, right? After Google announced this BERT or released the BERT, right? There are a lot of, lot of variants of BERT coming up, right? So you want to integrate them all, right? Uh, but actually, it's not, it not, it is not that easy, right? So some, some BERT using, uh, they are based on different frameworks, they are implemented in different frameworks, or they, they, uh, uh, they require different dependency, so you cannot really, let's say, uh, uh, immediately incorporate those new models into your existing framework. So this is a, this is a flexibility problem. And the, the third problem is the sustainability, right? So uh, a lot of deep learning mo uh, models, they actually have a very heavy dependency, right? It depends on TensorFlow at 1.15, right? This kind of very uh, concrete version restriction, right? And uh, uh, so, how do you solve this heavy dependency, right, if your system is completely coupled with this kind of dependency? And often, the, the deep learning system is uh, multi-architecture, right? So, some, some part of your system is probably running on CPU, the other part is probably running on GPU, right? Uh, so, it's not really maintainable. Uh, and finally, the accuracy, right? A lot of people seeing deep learning as kind of like a black box, so they don't know how to tune that. Uh, in, a, in a very uh, uh, accurate way, right? Okay, so those are the four challenges that people are facing when they when they uh, when they want to build neural search into production, right? Uh, so Gina actually provides a solution, right? So that's where that's why we do Gina, right? Because Gina provides the one-stop solution for solving all these problems. Uh, Gina is a cloud-native neural, solu neural search solution powered by state-of-the-art AI and deep learning. Uh, so this is a this is a slogan right? so that we put on GitHub. Right? So, but if I use simple word to explain uh, what is Gina, right? So I often explain in, in three different 
uh, let's say, uh, phrases. Okay. Uh, so first, I want to say uh, Gina is TensorFlow for search. Right? It's TensorFlow for search. So what is TensorFlow actually? So TensorFlow is a, just a symbol. So it doesn't represent the like the real TensorFlow, right? So it's just a symbol of all the general, very universal framework, deep learning framework. Uh, TensorFlow is very powerful, so you can use that to recognize uh, cats from dogs. Uh, but meanwhile, you can also use TensorFlow to play Go. Right? Uh, so it is a universal framework, deep learning framework that you can do everything. Right? Uh, well, Gina is uh, it's a framework that built on top of Tensor TensorFlow. Right? It's on top of TensorFlow, which is dedicated, which is tailored to search applications. Right. So this is what I mean TensorFlow for search. So the second is uh, a design pattern. Right. Uh, so basically, in the in the old days, in the classic search system, there is a certain design pattern such as analyzing, uh, tokenizing, this kind of thing. Right. But when it comes to neural search, right, there is a new design pattern, and nobody has given this yet. Right. So Gina actually provides. Uh, like not not just a proof of concept. So we have iterated this kind of idea uh, back in the back in uh, back in back in a uh, couple of years, right? Uh, so we we provide the design pattern, so you don't need to figure it out by yourself anymore. Right? Uh, the the last is of course the our company mission, right? So our company position is we we, we see ourselves as the next elastic, right? So this is uh, uh, how we. Uh, how we see ourselves and uh, what we are doing right now. Okay, so yeah, so this this graph basically explains uh, where we position Gina, right? So uh, so you can see the uh, AI development or the AI industry is like a inverse uh, pyramid, uh, where the, the at the very bottom you have the computing infrastructure. This includes the CPU, GPU, FPGA, cloud cloud service, and so on. Right. So on top of that, you have the framework. Uh, you have TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, Mansport, or uh, whatever. Right? And uh, Gina is actually one layer uh, above the framework, right? above those deep learning frameworks. So we actually embrace all, all kinds of deep learning frameworks. And, uh, and on top of that, we have end-to-end -end application. This could be machine translation, image recognition, search, uh, text generation, uh, face wrapping, and uh, data compression, and so on. Right? So Gina is a dedicated layer uh, on top of the deep learning, uh, on top of the universal deep learning framework, and it provides the infrastructure for search applications, right? For all kinds of search applications. So this is how we position Gina. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this also this is a list of what we can do right now with Gina. So you can use Gina for uh, long text, short text, semantic search, you can use Gina for image to image search, video to video, audio to audio, or, e or even any kind of document search. Right? You can use it for multi-modality search, cross-modality search, multi-facet search, and you can do index sharding, replicas, elastic, distributed workload, uh, model, containerization, uh, Docker, all this. Thing, right? uh, a lot of features that I listed here are already implemented uh, in the current version, and uh, some of them will be released in the next couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, so basically, as you can see, we provide a one-stop solution right, for all these kind of applications. Okay, uh, so we as a company, actually, we, uh, our goal is not to just implement one framework, one open source framework. Right? So open source framework is a play the core part of our company, right? so our core part, company product lines. But if you list all the uh, product lines that we planned uh, in our mind in, in the company landscape, right? Uh, we have Gina Core, which is basically the, 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 the open source frameworks that you see on GitHub. On top of that, we have Gina Hub, uh, which is a basically marketplace and it provides some main specific solution, uh, search specific solution, right? So you can imagine the relationship between the core and the hub is like a, a iOS and the App Store built on top of that. Uh, but we are not like a universal app store. We only provide app for search, right? uh, whether it is image search, whether it's a dog search, cat search. Uh, it is, the hub is actually driven by the community, right? It's contributed by the community. Uh, yeah, we also have a, like a prototype prototype of the hub uh, on GitHub, so you can you can check it out. Uh, and we we have echoes, 
Uh, Echoes basically provides some enterprise features such as dashboard, auditing, log monitoring, alerts, this kind of thing. Right? And uh, finally, on top of all of this thing, we provide the cloud service, but this is a like, long-term goal. Okay, uh, highlights of Gina. Uh, yeah, so this is basically, uh, you, can, you, can, you can get all this uh, uh, bullet point from, the, uh, from a GitHub. Uh, it's a universal search solution. It can uh, run, it can search for any kind of modality, and uh, it can even run on Raspberry Pi. So if you install, if you pip install Gina on Raspberry Pi, it will also work. And run pip uh, Gina hello world, it also works. And uh, it is very high performance and uh, state of the art. Uh, we actually spend a lot of time to uh, polish the user experience, right, to help uh, the developer on board. And we actually made the API very simple and very easy to use. And uh, so this is, uh, so you, you, when, you, when you use Gina to implement a new research uh, solution, you will realize that it's actually much, much simpler than you, than you imagined, than you thought it was. Right? Um, so, <clears throat> and also like Gina Hub is actually a very, provides a very powerful extension and very simple integration to, to the Gina core. And uh, you will see that in the Flow API. Okay, so uh, I think a good start of, of, uh, of getting to know Gina is actually to run this hello world. Right? So if you have, if you right now you have a uh, Mike or Linux uh, operating system and with Python uh, 3.7 or above installs, then you can simply do pip install Gina and then Gina hello world. Right? So it, it will run the end-to-end uh, -end, uh, image search uh, on, on your laptop. Uh, so if you don't have like Python 3.7 or you don't want to install Python 3.7, but you have Docker installed, right? So you have Docker installed on your Mac, on your Linux, you just copy paste this, uh, this kind of command line, one liner uh, in your terminal, and then you can run the hello world. Uh, so here I will just run this thing uh, for, uh, because in the rehearsal I tried to run this thing, and actually it eats a lot of resources. and. Uh, uh, turn out the, the, the video streaming becomes very laggy when I run this thing. But it's actually very understandable because Gina is actually, uh, when you run Gina uh, locally, right, it starts multiple processes uh, and uh, they, they start to communicate with each other. And that's actually, uh, uh, that's actually like uh, makes the video streaming very, very laggy. Right? But uh, so, so, for example, here, so I will just uh, clear the terminal here. And uh, you can run the Gina hello world. I think you can just run Gina hello world. Okay, so it will start to download the fetch empty state set and do the indexing and so on. Right, I will stop here because otherwise it becomes very laggy. Right, so I will just stop here. Right, or you can also use the uh, you can also use uh, so I will just clear the terminal here. Or you can also use like a Gina log profiling. You turn on the profiling and then turn on the log server. Uh, so once you do that, you actually will, uh, you can do the, uh, you can go to our dashboard. You can go to our dashboard here, right? So you actually, oops. Yeah, so here you basically, you can, you will see how the, uh, so for example here, if I run this thing and uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't shouldn't run this thing because then it becomes very very laggy. Uh, okay, let's 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 terminate here. Let's, let's, okay. Uh, okay, where is it? Okay, I'll, I'll just terminate here because otherwise the the the, the computer is not useful anymore. Uh, but anyway, I have the. I have the screenshot right prepared because this is always like the case when you show something it, it's become very buggy and then you have to prepare some screenshot for backup to, to cover the embarrassment, uh, embarrassment uh, of yourself right and uh, uh, okay so anyway so what does, what does it do right? what, what, what just happened if you run the Gina hello world right it's basically showcase an end-to-end -end neural search uh, system with uh, index and search uh, two procedure right in, in one line right? So first, it downloads the FetchMD dataset, including the training part and test set, and also the uh, 60,000, uh, so it, it then throws the 60,000 training image for indexing, 
and then it randomly sample 50 queries from the test set and then from the top 50 visually most, uh, uh, most uh, similar images and write to uh, HTML. Right? And uh, so this is, uh, this is what happened. Right? So, so as you can see the result. Uh, Okay, so hello world is very is very simple, right? So you, you usually expect that is it is very simple, right? But it's uh, it's actually so if you look at the implementation behind that, it is also very straightforward, right? So we have a Python API which basically loads, uh, let's say, a workflow from a YAML file, right? Uh, YAML is like a JSON file, right? So it's like uh, some kind of a, a schema that uh, uh, domain, uh, some domain specific uh, language, right? Defining domain specific language. Uh, yeah, so, so YAML file is, is uh, look like that, so it basically defines the workflow, right? And uh, uh, so we have parts, we have this kind of uh, different components here, so each component can be, so we, 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 we call it a part here, but it's actually, you, you can imagine it's like a, each, each one is, each part is like a microservice, right? And uh, so if you, if you say, okay, so I, I, I never learned YAML, I'm a JSON guy, right? So I'm a, I'm a JSON guy, I, I, I don't like YAML. So, so that's that's no problem. So you can you can uh, you can design your flow right in the dashboard right. So by, by just drag and drop there, and uh, so the, and then you just copy the just generate YAML to 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 some file and then load it. So that's it. Right? So it it is actually we provide different ways to for you to design the flow. That includes using the Python API, using the YAML file, or using the dashboard. And we will see that later. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so all these logs, so, so when we run this thing, right, so, uh, yeah, so let's, let's just scroll it up a little bit. So when we run this thing, you see a lot of like, uh, there's a triangle and it seems like a message is propagating, it is, right, it is a message propagating over different microservices, or over different paths, right. Uh, and uh, so you, you can see that, oops, where is it, okay. So you can see each part here in the flow actually corresponds to the uh, to, to to the line to each log log uh, here log, log record here, right? So and uh, yeah, so that's that's basically how Gina works. Right? It propagates the request into different microservices, uh, so it's actually parallel in nature. Okay. Uh, so that's 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 a good start, right? So you see the log is. Uh, Scrolling, you have very uh, intuitive idea. The first impression of how Gina works, you understand. Okay, Gina is probably like uh, propagating something in uh, message over all the microservices, and uh, Gina is kind of like uh, yeah, you can deploy all these microservices here and there on different machines. Uh, so you get the first idea, right? But in order to understand how Gina really works, so I should suggest everybody read. Uh, Gina 101, this is a key concept in Gina, right? So it's, it's actually uh, explained uh, everything uh, in a very, let's, let's say, cartoonish uh, way, right? So you can, you can just simply type Gina 101, right? And then you go to this page, right? So you, you see the, the, it actually explained from very low level to, uh, from the very, very, very low level from the document and chunk to YAML config and the executor, a family of executors. So you see these four guys, right? So these four gear guys, right? This actually corresponds to the, uh, you remember the, the four different, uh, uh, four, four important steps that we, we do we, when, when we do the neural search, right? Encoding, uh, preprocessing, and uh, storing and indexing, right? So th those four gears actually uh, correspond to that, right? But actually, the, the families are not restricted to those four gears, right? So you can, we can at any time adding more gears, adding more family members to this uh, executor family. Right? And we have driver, uh, we have P part uh, flow, and eventually we have a, this kind of like a big family here. Right? Okay, so that's good because uh, it actually so for those who who don't know much about microservice because I know some probably data scientists they, they never uh, they never learn like a microservice in a very let's say in very uh, uh, in a very form, formal way right so that's that's fine because you just read uh, Gina one hundred one and you get the idea right? okay so what are those characters uh, if you, if you put that into the code right so uh, here you can see that this is actually the source code behind uh, Gina hello world right. So from the left column, 
from the leftmost column, we have the executor, right? We have the, all this uh, like a uh, crafter, segmenter, uh, encoder, all this uh, very, let's say, alg algorithmic unit, uh, which is uh, basically like a written in Python or NumPy, right? And, uh, but those, those executor doesn't, they cannot talk to each other, right? So, because they are, they are actually isolating the microservice, right? So they, you, you cannot just talk to each other like you're talking the Python function, right? So in order to do that, you actually have to grant some kind of communication uh, ability, network communication ability, by using the driver. So this driver basically defines how this executor talks to each other uh, under some, some kind of request. Right? So for example, under the index request, okay, so you, how, how should you talk to each other? Right? Under the search request, how, how should you talk to each other? Right? And this, this talking schema actually is defined with YAML. And then one layer on top of that, we can wrap all the uh, driver executor YAML into a P, right? And you can also, let's say you want to uh, start multiple P's and you just wrap all the P's in, into a part, right? And eventually you put everything in a flow, right? So the flow actually represents a high level task, such as indexing, searching, training, this kind of thing, right? And uh, yeah, so that's actually from the micro level to the macro level. From the left side to the rightmost side. Uh, yeah, I think there is an animation. Yeah, from the micro level executor to the driver, and then driver with YAML, uh, they wrapped into a P. And a P, if you want to scale it up, you want to set replicas, you want to set shots, and uh, so they, they are wrapped into a single part. And then you connect the part together uh, with a flow API, and this finally becomes your high level task uh, in the flow. So this is, this is how the logic uh, evolves, right? Okay, so uh, now let's talk about the flow API, right? The flow API is probably the first thing that you notice uh, when you look at all the examples, all the tutorials in, in, in our GitHub, on our GitHub re repo, right? Uh, so flow API is actually the interface that we provide, it's one of the interfaces uh, that we provide for, the, for developers, right? So you can use that to uh, it's like a translate layer, right? So you can translate the YAML file, uh, the Python file, or, the, or even the dashboards, the interactive dashboard, into something uh, that you want to, uh, some, some kind of backend, backend that you want to run, right? So if you use Flow API locally, right? Then basically it runs as a multi-process or multi-threading, right? Uh, you can also use Flow API to run, uh, to start a, a Kubernetes, and the Docker Swarm, so that's also possible. So, uh, Flow API, strictly speaking, is a, like a context manager for managing all the PPaaS and all the context of all those PPaaS. So you don't worry, you don't have to worry about who connects to who and uh, what is a P, uh, port number and uh, how so, how should they communicate with each other, right? And uh, these are all taken care of about, uh, by the Flow API. And uh, Kubernetes support and Docker Swarm support and other orchestration layer support, uh, this is still under development. Uh, but at the end of the day, so you can use Flow API to generate the YAML config or JSON config that you need uh, to deploy it on the cloud. Right. Okay, so here at least some very uh, like uh, usage, some, some very simple usage of Flow API. So as you can see here, adding a path into the flow is actually very simple. So you just uh, use add, 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 and then you pick some attributes and also the YAML, YAML file, YAML path. Right? And I can also say, so this is very interesting. I, I, I always like it. Uh, I always like this feature because I think this is how we, uh, one of the highlights in Flow API. So basically you can run one of the part, right? Not all the part, one of the part remotely, right? And you can also run one of the part remotely inside a Docker container by specifying the image uh, of this part. Uh, so once you specify, uh, once you specify the, uh, the host and the image, then this, this part is actually, you know, is like a wrapped in the box and then put it in the, in the, on the other side of the earth, right? Uh, yeah, so this is a, this is a very powerful uh, feature. And then you can, of course, uh, build parallel steps by using the uh, keyword needs and join, right? So you, you, can, you can branch uh, the, the steps and do it in parallel and then uh, wait until all the steps finish. 
so this is Python API, right? For 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 some reason, people uh, let's say you 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 do this in production, right? You cannot change the source code so frequently, right? So that's why you separate the code itself from the uh, you separate the the the, uh, the structure of the flow from the code itself, right? So that's why you write a independent YAML file. Right? So that's that's no problem. So you can use flow to load this YAML file. Uh, into into memory and run this run this flow. Uh, to feed data into a flow is very simple. You just use with this kind of like a context manager. You open this context and do the uh, f dot search, and that's it. Right. So this is and uh, you give the input function to tell the flow. Okay, so you should grab the input from this function, and this function is probably some generator, right? And uh, okay, then you should write. Uh, your output into with this this kind of callback function, right? So in this case, it's as simple as print, right? So that means I do uh, every time you receive a request, uh, every time a request uh, make a round tree, right? Back and forth, then you print it, right? So this as simple as that. Okay, here I list all the examples that we have right now uh, for advanced PPAS. Uh, API and flow API usage. Right? So you can see uh, we have feature extraction. Uh, this is some feature that I actually I, I was all, always asked by the community when I was uh, when I when I was doing the bird eye service, right? And uh, people often ask me, okay, Han, can you do X as service, right? Can you do Albert as service? Can you do whatever B or bird as service? Uh, Actually, in this case, if you use Gina, that's actually like a work out of the box. You just give a different Docker image, and uh, that's it. And uh, so you use the same workflow, you use the same pipeline, and then you can extract the, 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 the feature. Right? So in this case, we give an example. We use Hugging Face Transformer to extract the feature, well, and scale it in parallel. Right? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. And we have image search. This is a not 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 so big deal, right? So uh, searching flowers, searching uh, similar flowers. We have QA search. This is uh, I, I believe this is a source pack, source pack script. Uh, and uh, so you can you can type a, type in a script and then it will look for a uh, similar script. We also have a video search, right? So this is based on Tumblr uh, GIF dataset, right? So you basically can throw in a GIF image and go like. Uh, from all the related videos. Right? And here, uh, back to the hello world example, we can also split the hello world into client and the server architecture, right? So you deploy the server on the remotely, and then you, you, you use local client to uh, send data to the server, right? Uh, so this is, uh, so you can find out the examples here. Right? It's also very, very simple, very, very intuitive. Uh, so all these examples are available on GitHub, so you can use this shortcut learn.gina.ai to get all the examples. Okay, so uh, now let's summarize a little bit. So we have seen Gina can do this and that, can do a lot of things, right? So uh, when people come to the Gina GitHub repository, right, the first thing that uh, Gina is probably some like a very small toolkit, like a bird service, right? So it's, uh, and then once they realize that Gina is actually a, it's very ambitious, it's actually doing a lot of things, and uh, uh, it's trying to become the uh, cloud native framework uh, for neural research, right? And they they they, they become uh, scared, right? They don't know how to start, right? Uh, they don't know where to how how to learn this thing, right? So here I summarize the best way the best way to learn Gina. Uh, uh, for beginners, right? So first, as I said, you first you have to run the Gina Hello World, right? We we spend quite some time to make it very. Uh, uh, there is uh, there is actually no dependency uh, for Gina Hello World. You just pip install Gina and then run Gina Hello World. You don't need any TensorFlow or a specific version of PyTorch or whatever, right? You don't need some database, MySQL, NoSQL, whatever. Uh, you just run Gina Hello World. Everything it can be run out of the box, and. Uh, uh, if you don't have Python 3.7, right, then you use Docker, right? Uh, so this is uh, this is also uh, this is also doable. Right? And then after you run the Gina Hello World, you you read Gina 101, right? So this is like a must. You must read this thing right? to understand the key concept, to understand the P pass, uh, to understand what is the driver, executor, this uh, this kind of terms, right? Uh, 
And then once you get these cartoon characters, once you get to know these cartoon characters, you can you can read the first tutorial, first two tutorials. One is the flow API, so that you, you know how the examples work and how the examples are written. And uh, I.O. functions. I.O. functions are of course very important because uh, yeah, you have to know how to feed and retrieve data from and to the flow, right? Uh, to and from the flow. <coughs> And then once these steps are done, you can really dig into the Hello World example and look at the uh, other more advanced uh, search, application, uh, search applications such as NLP, this uh, poem search, uh, script search, uh, image search, flower search, video search, and so on. Right? And of course, if you anytime encounter any problem, you can read the docs. We actually build the docs in a very, let's say, uh, we actually spend some kind of a, like a graphic design effort on the, on the docs because we know that uh, developers spend a lot of time on the on docs reading, so we want to make sure that their experience are actually uh, like uh, you know uh, more enjoyable. Yeah. Okay, so after all these steps, right, it's now uh, really like you can uh, build your own search system with Gina. Yeah, try try that. Try to build your next search system with Gina. Uh, speaking about the learning experience, we really care about the onboarding experience for new developers. Right? So that's why we actually de de define different milestones for developers and we actually uh, optimize uh, the learning experience for different level of developers. Right? So we have the uh, one on one cartoon ish uh, storybook and we have the very uh, comprehensive and we are still adding more, more examples to the uh, to the tutorial list, and uh, we also have a very nicely written, well, at least it's very, it looks very beautiful, right, uh, document here, and uh, uh, we, all, we will also launch our tech blog, uh, like, in, in the next month. Uh, the tech blog will also be community-driven, so we will write something, and we also encourage community to share their learning experience about Gina, and uh, uh, we, can, we can publish it together. Uh, apart from that, so if you ever encounter any issues uh, when using Gina, please uh, submit an issue uh, on our GitHub repository, or if you prefer more like an interactive uh, chit chat uh, style, you can use our Slack channel. So we already have some members there, and uh, so we have like a daily discussion about yeah, so what is Gina and uh, how how to do that, how to do this, uh, what is wrong with this part, this kind of thing, right? Okay, so that basically concludes the uh, <coughs> concludes the AI uh, the Gina as a project. So now let's talk about the uh, the Gina AI as a as an open source company, right? Uh, <coughs> so the first thing I, I always uh, like I was often often asked uh, by by some people is that okay, the Gina is great, Gina is ambitious, so why don't you work Gina at X? And X is some kind of like a uh, some tech giant, and uh, my answer to that is that uh, we actually care more about uh, neurosearch. We care more about the community. We care more about the open source, and that's why uh, I'm stepping out from the tech giant and uh, doing this as a startup and raising money to do that as a startup. Right. And. Uh, uh, we actually, we, so all of our co-founders that we, uh, we have, we, we actually share a very strong belief, believe that open source AI infrastructure is the future, right? And we believe that uh, uh, we, 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 we want to build this thing with the community, right? And uh, uh, there, there are a couple of things that we want to change and we will change that. So this is our, our very strong belief. And uh, so our company culture actually encourage people to change things if they don't like that. Right? And uh, yeah, so that's that's basically the answer. Another another. So some people may, may think of that okay. So you, if you work that in the tech giants, right? So you probably get more resources to let's say PR for branding and so on, right? Uh, but that count as a hobby for the tech giants, all right? But this is this this is something more for us. Uh, so this is a major difference because we care more. Because we care more, we can pay more details, pay more attention to to optimize uh, for the community to make this project more sustainable and open source. And uh, this is a this is the thing. This is the reason and motivation what drives us to uh, do this as a company. Right? And we also have our own understanding about the company uh, about open source, right? 
a lot of people think that okay, so your open source is probably like uh, you open source your source code on GitHub, right? And then you collect the stars, right? And uh, uh, actually, that's the easy part. The, the more difficult part is the open governance, right? Uh, how do you make your project sustainable uh, over long term? How do you provide long term support, right? And uh, we fortunately we are venture back team, so we have enough funding to. Uh, give this Gina very long-term support and we will build uh, very uh, we will build a lot of synergy with the community and to have a more open go governance model here. Uh, yeah so here specifically yeah we will make our projects very sustainable and also community driven. Uh, we will build synergy with other open source software. Uh, so if you look at our Gina code, we actually have uh, have already incorporated many interfaces such as uh, yeah TensorFlow, PyTorch, this this kind of and also Hacking Face Transformer, and also uh, Farm from DeepSet, and uh, uh, Fast from Facebook. This one, right? Uh, yeah. So we we love to do the synergy uh, with other open source software. And uh, yeah, we are also looking for partnership to build an open governance model, such as a technical steering committee around Gina, so we can discuss the challenge and uh, challenges and Docker in the new research, and then we can solve it and push the whole community forward together. Right? Okay, so uh, that being said, if you are interested in uh, any of the jobs that we provide, so we actually right, right now, as I said, we have AI engineers in full time and. Uh, uh, AI product manager, uh, open source evangelist, and also the uh, full stack uh, engineers. So if you are looking for any of the full-time job doing open source, especially AI in search, if you believe in your search, yeah, then please submit your resume uh, and follow the instruction on the website. And uh, we are looking forward to have you on board. And uh, yeah, so that's basically it. That's basically the today's session. And uh,